This is part B of the Arizona Executive Branch presentation. The Secretary of State is the second most important position in the state government because the Secretary of State is the successor to the governor. Jan Brewer was the Secretary of State before uh, she became governor when Napolitano resigned the Secretary of State Brewer assumed the office of the governorship. So that, that's one important function of the Secretary of State. But unlike the Vice Presidency, the Secretary of State has an actual day job as well as just waiting in the wings for the governor to uh, die or retire. Uh, what the Secretary of State's primary responsibilities are is to administer elections in the state. They do this by uh, overseeing the county recorders. Uh, the counties actually run the elections in Arizona. They purchase the voting machines. They maintain the voting records. They collect the ballots, and they report the results back into the Secretary of State. So the Secretary of State's job is to make sure that that process is done in an orderly way, and in a fair way so that the integrity of the vote is guaranteed. Now, if you recall from an earlier presentation, Arizona is under Department of Justice oversight when it comes to elections because of uh, our examples, our previous past record of uh, racist policies that had undermined the integrity of some of our elections. So the Secretary of State has to uh, coordinate and cooperate with the Federal Department of Justice um, as they administer these elections and guarantee their integrity. The Secretary of State also maintains the voter rolls so that when you register to vote, you might turn that into the county recorder, but the county recorder then submits that registration information to the Secretary of State. And the Secretary of State is ultimately the entity that decides whose registration is valid and whose is not, and which voting location uh, a given voter is allowed to vote at. The Secretary of State also approves candidates and ballot propositions. So if you want to run for office, you have to go to the Secretary of State, you register as a candidate, and the Secretary of State then gives you uh, forms that you take and have registered voters sign uh, a petition, essentially. And you have to have a certain number of those petitions in order to qualify as a candidate. Likewise, a ballot proposition if it is a voter initiative, has to have a certain amount of qualified voters sign those petitions. The Secretary of State's job is to go through those signature forms and make sure that the people who signed those petitions are indeed registered Arizona voters. And so they approve those candidates and also approve the final wording on the propositions and produce and distribute voter information packets on candidates and propositions. And finally, the Secretary of State is responsible for uh, printing and distributing ballots uh, to the county recorders who then handle the actual taking of the votes and then as those county recorders return those results to the Secretary of State, the Secretary of State is responsible to tally the votes and issue the official outcome of a given vote. So it's a fairly important job and can be uh, quite busy on election years. The attention the job gets, though, is often that of the successor to the governor because uh, maintaining the integrity of elections is a sort of quiet, behind-the-scenes job. 
until the governor retires or dies. At that point, the Secretary of State office receives a lot of attention. Now, there is a proposition which will be on the 2010 ballot that will that, that seeks to change the title of Secretary of State to that of Lieutenant Governor to make it more clear to voters that when they're voting for Secretary of State, they are also voting for who the next governor will be. For example, in the 2006 election, Jan Brewer ran as Secretary of State unopposed. The Democrats did not even field a candidate as, for Secretary of State to run against Brewer, even though Napolitano's name had already been distributed nationwide uh, on a short list as a very real potential cabinet member should a Democrat win the White House in 2008. And so political observers could predict that if the Democrats won the White House, then whoever was Secretary of State would become governor. And yet in spite of that, again, the Democratic Party didn't even feel the candidate. So by changing the name of the position to uh, lieutenant governor, it would make it more clear what the impact of that office was so that voters could vote for Secretary of State, uh, keeping that potential governorship in mind. So we'll have to see whether the voters approve that uh, proposition, but it underscores the importance of the Secretary of State positions in that particular instance of succession. The next executive office is the Attorney General. Now, the Attorney General, as the name implies, is the highest-ranking law enforcement office in the state of Arizona. The Attorney General's responsibilities are to uh, investigate and prosecute statewide crimes and direct the attorneys who work for the state uh, in that uh, regard. Now, in that job of investigating state crimes, the Attorney General is careful not to uh, overstep the boundaries of uh, municipal attorneys and prosecutors and attorney, uh, sorry, county attorneys and prosecutors, uh, all of whom do the vast majority of criminal prosecutions in the state. But there are some crimes that are engaged in statewide that the attorney general focuses on. In particular would be crimes that involve uh, gambling and lottery crimes. Uh, in addition, would be crimes that involve fraud, uh, securities crimes, so crimes that are defrauding investors or are using the mail or email or the phone to uh, bilk people from their uh, money or identity theft. Uh, these kinds of crimes are larger in scale than a city or county attorney uh, could investigate. So the statewide investigation can occur under the attorney general's auspices. Now, in addition, a, a key part of the job of attorney general is to legally represent the state. So when uh, the federal government sues the state, it is the attorney general who represents the state. When the state sues another state or is sued by another state, uh, they're represented by the attorney general. Um, if the state has to appear in a federal court for any reason, the attorney general's office sends people. Uh, when, for example, uh, a death penalty uh, case goes to the Supreme Court, it is a representative of the Attorney General who will go and argue that case uh, before the Supreme Court. And Arizona has a 
a fairly good record actually in that um, domain of death penalty cases. Uh, in addition, the Attorney General will write legislative opinions. Quite often, the legislature will write a bill that is vaguely worded, and how that bill is interpreted will impact how the bill is executed by other state and local authorities. And so that legal interpretation is necessary for state agencies or law enforcement to know how to enforce that law. So the Attorney General will write a legislative opinion that then provides the ground rules that other agencies use. Now, occasionally that legislative opinion may run counter to the legislative intent of the legislature, uh, but nevertheless, the Attorney General has the authority to make and write that opinion that is then binding on other state and local entities. The Attorney General also supervises the county attorneys, so the Attorney General's job is to make sure that those attorneys are performing their jobs with integrity and not making legal mistakes or misusing their office. Now, the Attorney General doesn't actually um, use this power very often because the county attorneys are elected independently and it would create a fairly serious political firestorm if the elected attorney general were to publicly oppose and admonish an elected county attorney. Uh, but the attorney general does have that authority to, to do so. It just rarely happens. One final point to make about the Attorney General, because it does impact the way the office is administered, is that the Attorney General is a very publicly vocal and prestigious position. And so that position is often a springboard for candidates to run for governor. And so quite often Arizona has two ambitious people who are either currently or in the future will run against each other in a gubernatorial election, which means they are often at odds with one another, which further complicates the ability of the executive branch to function in a coherent way. The next office is the state treasurer. Uh, similar to the Secretary of State, the state treasurer is a publicly elected office that usually operates behind the scenes. Uh, the state treasurer does not typically have a very prominent role in the state's politics, but it is a very important office. Uh, the state treasurer is the state's chief financial officer which means that all the state employees who get a paycheck, their check is signed by the state treasurer. It's the state treasurer's job to make sure that the state's money is safe and that it is being collected and dispersed in an ethical manner that uses the best accounting processes uh, possible. So the treasurer is responsible for collecting revenue. So the taxes and fees and other uh, revenue streams that the state has, the treasurer gathers that money in and uh, makes keeps track of it. The treasurer also is responsible for investing the state funds. Uh, the state has a retirement fund that uh, money is drawn out of employees every paycheck and that money is then used to pay the obligations of current pensioners and retirees. Now the money that is drawn in exceeds the obligations to go out and so the state treasurer is responsible to invest that money in 
a way that protects the um, the capital, but also provides a reasonable return on that investment so that future retirees, when they retire, uh, that money will be available to them. Particularly as the baby boomers retire, uh, this problem will, well, this could become a problem because as the boomers retire, the money coming into the retirement system will not be sufficient to pay the obligations. And so this treasurer is going to need to cash in those investments in order to uh, maintain the solvency of the state retirement system. Uh, so it's, it's a complex job that, uh, again, is typically done behind the scenes, but it is an elected uh, position all the same. The superintendent of public instruction is also independently elected. Now, this position is actually a fairly weak position. Uh, it doesn't have the kind of power that the title suggests that it have. And one reason for its weakness is that there are many entities in the state that have a say in education policy. And so the superintendent can provide direction, but they can't really control the uh, schools in Arizona because there's much more uh, local control within the school districts than uh, the, the title superintendent suggests. But uh, the superintendent does have some responsibilities that do impact education policy. The superintendent is responsible for managing the Department of Education to make sure that that department runs smoothly and provides the direction and resources that the school districts around the state require to uh, do their jobs efficiently. The superintendent is also responsible for certifying teachers. So that is a, a statewide function. Uh, this makes it so that the local school districts can rely on that state certification so that they can hire teachers who are competent and qualified. The superintendent also directs the AIMS testing. AIMS is the standardized test to assess the competence of Arizona students in various areas. The test is written uh, by the office of the superintendent. Uh, they may not actually write it, but they are responsible uh, for its content, and they select um, the questions that will be included in the test. They also are responsible for uh, maintaining the integrity of the test and producing the and distributing copies of the test and, and logistical things of, of that nature. The superintendent is responsible for approving textbooks. Now, in other states, textbooks are approved by local school districts. Um, on the other hand, there are other states that all of the textbooks are purchased by the State Department of Education. Now, in Arizona, uh, textbooks may be purchased by the local district, but the local districts have to purchase those books from a list that is approved by the superintendent. So it's Arizona is kind of a middle ground between other states that the central department does everything versus some states where the local district does everything. Uh, in Arizona, the superintendent approves the textbooks, but the selection from the list of approved textbooks is made by the local districts. The superintendent also provides direct funding for public and charter schools. Now, that funding may vary from district to district as local property taxes and bond issues may collect resources specific to those districts, but the state legislature allocates money to be given 
to the schools around the state and it is the superintendent of public instruction that is the conduit through which those uh, state allocations of money uh, make their way to the local schools. So uh, again, the superintendent has to work with uh, entities at the state level, with um, commissions and the legislature and the governor, uh, has to work with institutions at the federal level, with the Department of Education, and also has to work with institutions at the local level, with district school boards and district superintendents. So working in concert with all of those actors, the superintendent does have an impact on education policy, but it is, uh, again, a, a less of an impact than some of the other executive branch offices that we have discussed. The Corporation Commission is another uh, interesting and unique uh, part of the executive branch in Arizona. Uh, if you remember, if we go back to the Progressive Era framers of the Arizona Constitution and the territorial history of corruption that existed between the mining and corporate interests and the territorial government, um, the founders of the Constitution wanted an independent voice that was answerable to the people and less likely to be captured by those corporate interests. You know, they wanted that independent voice to manage the affairs of these corporations and enable a, a way for citizens to um, not be taken advantage of or exploited by these powerful corporations. The Corporation Commission then is responsible for certifying businesses, meaning to issuing business licenses. Uh, it regulates the stock and security exchanges in Arizona. So Arizona firms that want to sell stock have to be certified by the Corporation Commission and have to abide by uh, the rules and regulations and open themselves to the oversight of the Corporation Commission. They also regulate utilities and other legalized monopolies. Uh, so when the water or power utility seeks to increase the rates that they want to charge their customers, they have to take that rate increase to the Corporation Commission and receive the Commission's permission before it can enact that price increase. Or if the utility wants to run a power line across a mountain from a power generating station down to a community, it is the Corporation Commission who they must seek approval for in addition to whatever environmental regulations they would have to um, comply with. Uh, the Corporation Commission is also responsible to make sure that these utilities and legalized monopolies maintain a certain basic level of service to their customers so that if uh, say a cable provider was providing really terrible service then next time that cable company would come to the corporation commission and seek a rate increase the Commission might turn that increase down and say that until you improve your customer service, you cannot increase your rates. So the Corporation Commission is supposed to serve as an advocate for citizens and consumers in Arizona vis-a-vis uh, -vis the corporations. Now that has not always been the case because uh, like any elected official, uh, interest groups and elected officials can form iron triangles to create regulations that are favorable to that industry. But um, when the public is engaged or when the Corporation Commission is vigilant, it can serve as that
consumer advocate. The final elected position is that of the state mine inspector. Now, this position is also an outgrowth of the mistrust by the constitutional framers of what used to be the most powerful industry in the state, which was the mining industry. The founders of the Constitution wanted to ensure an independent inspector to ensure the safety of workers, uh, even when the mining industry might be controlling the governor's office. So the job of the state mine inspector is to uh, look at the health and safety of the mines in Arizona. Now, I should note that other statewide health and safety inspectors are appointed by the governor. It's only the mining industry that has an independent elected official who uh, inspects their industry. Again, it, it harkens back to the territorial days in Arizona when the mining industry was so powerful. So to conclude this presentation on the Arizona executive branch, what we've seen is that divided government makes it difficult for the executive branch to make a clear policy. And it makes it difficult for any one governor to have a long-term impact on that policy. Now, earlier I gave the example of Governor Napolitano giving an executive order to have Arizona participate in the regional climate compact and authorizing the Department of Environmental Quality to issue stringent rules on carbon emissions. And as soon as Napolitano went to Washington, her successor, Governor Brewer, reversed those rules, withdrew the state from the Regional Climate Compact, and prohibited the ADAQ from participating in any talks with neighboring states about that compact. Now, if we combine this example with other recurring spats and arguments with other elected officials who hold real executive power in the state, it's easy to see that it's difficult to accomplish anything in the state unless a consensus is built between the individuals within the executive branch and with the other legislative and judicial branches. Uh, absent that consensus, Arizona experiences half-starts and reverses in policy domain. Now, the next presentation will look at local government, and what we'll see there is that it, too, is divided by the same pluralization of power. This presentation is courtesy of Brian Dilley. I'm the speaker, and I'm a professor of political science at Mesa Community College, a college of the Maricopa Community College District in Mesa, Arizona. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation.